Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I give you my mind. I give you my heart. I'm open to what you want to do tonight. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. God is so good. You guys may be seated. Let's give another hand for Jesus. I mean, Jesus, he's the ultimate. He's the, he's the ultimate hero. We saw these superheroes, man. Ain't nobody like Jesus, right? You know, God gave me a message specifically for you in the room. And the way that God works when I preach, he, he gives it to me, just downloads the whole message to me. And he told me, I'm not going to give it to you until the day of. I was like, oh, man. But it puts you in a place to hear from God, depend on God, and have faith to deliver a word from God. And so prophetically speaking today, I want you to receive this word for you, for your family, and I want you to receive this word for your community. The title of today, of this message is called, God, I'm Broken. God, I'm broken. You see, all throughout the Bible, you'll see God use broken people, broken situations to do great things, to show his love, to show and display his power. Two things that, that God does in our brokenness is first he reveals his love and power to you. But second, he reveals his love and his power to others through your brokenness. God wants to use the brokenness in three areas. The first one, number one, God wants to use the brokenness within ourselves. He wants to use it. John 8, 1 through 11, it says, Jesus walked up the Mount of Olives near the city where he spent the night. Then at dawn, Jesus appeared in the temple courts again. And soon all the people gathered around to listen to his words. So he sat down and taught them. Then in the middle of his teaching, the religious scholars and the Pharisees broke through the crowd and brought a woman who had been caught in the act of committing adultery and made her stand in the middle of everyone. Uh-oh. Then they said to Jesus, teacher, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. Verse 5, doesn't Moses' law command us to stone to death a woman like this? Tell us, what do you say we should do with her? Verse 6 says, they were only testing Jesus because they hoped to trap him with his own words and accuse him of breaking the laws of Moses. But Jesus didn't answer them. Instead, he simply bent down and wrote in the dust with his finger. Angry, they kept, they kept insisting that he answer their question. So Jesus stood up. And looked at them and said, let's have the man who has never had a sinful desire throw the first stone at her. And then he bent over again and wrote some more words in the dust. Upon hearing that, her accusers slowly left the crowd one at a time. Beginning with the oldest to the youngest with a convicted conscience. Until finally Jesus was left alone with the woman still standing there in front of him. So he stood back up and said to her, dear woman, where are your accusers? Is there no one here to condemn you? Looking around, 
She replied, I see no one, Lord. Jesus said, then I certainly don't con condemn you either. Go and from now on be free from a life of sin. You see, God used her broken situation to reveal his love and to display his forgiveness. Her brokenness made that way for forgiveness to be shown. Not just for her to see it, but for others to see it. You see, I, I, God was showing me that sometimes we're in a position where we're, where we're saying, God, take me out of this brokenness. And God's saying, let me, let me use this brokenness. God, heal me and, and change it. But how about this? God, meet me in my brokenness. It's something else when God just meets you in the brokenness, isn't it? When he meets you in that place where you're just broken. I mean, she was literally going to be stoned, caught red-handed. In Genesis, there's a man named Joseph in, in um, chapter 50, verse 20. His, his brothers betrayed him. And after they betrayed him and sell him to be, to be a slave, they feel like their brother, Joseph, is going to take vengeance now since his father passed away. But this is Joseph's response. You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. I want to speak into your, your brokenness right now, into the situation that you're in right now, and let you know that God will use that for good, that God will turn it around for good. <laughs> brokenness, it, it leads to a lot of pain, questions, but let God use that brokenness within yourself. Sometimes we try to, especially for all of those believers and, that are in here, we try to hide the brokenness. We try to hide what's really going on in our minds. We try to, to make it seem like we got it all together. We don't want no one to know that, that we're struggling with something, that we're in a broken season. And I know some of us right now, you might be like, I'm not in a broken season right now. I feel like everything is great in this season, and, and it can be. But if we're honest with ourselves, we experience brokenness. If you ever lost someone dear to your heart, you experience some brokenness. God's saying, I want to use everything that has broken you. I want to use it. I want to use it to show you how much I love you, to show the people around you how good your God is, to show your family how great your God is. Let's not deny our brokenness. Let's say, God, just use it. I'm going to be honest with you, God, I'm broken. This is your son right here. I'm just broken. This is your daughter right here. I'm broken. In this area of my life, I feel shattered, God. Because the devil doesn't want you to have that honest conversation with God. He wants you to just try to handle it yourself. He wants you to not tell your, your mentors or your or leaders or go to counseling. He wants you to just try to just stay broken and find a way to function while you're broken. Without God, without his Holy Spirit. God could restore you. God could renew your whole mind. My mind was totally gone. Totally gone. And I remember there was a day, and I haven't really shared this on the pulpit, but how I got my call and how God showed me that, Gabe, I want you to preach the good news and to pastor and shepherd people. It was when I was in sin in a broken place. I was a Christian for two to three months. 
I hung out with the wrong crowd and, and, and I thought I was gonna go and, and help them, but um, they helped me to some cervezas. And then it switched up real quick. I felt like that one drink of Bud Light, for every of you that know, like that Bud Light, like that one drink of Bud Light, it felt like tequila. And it took me down such a dark path that I became so shameful. That night I ended up doing crystal meth. I ended up doing all kinds of stuff that night just because I was so condemned in my brokenness and I felt like God will never use me again. All the Christians that I met the last couple months, they're cool, nice people, but I'm not one of them. They ain't over here doing the grime that I'm doing. They'd probably be like, that guy is weird. He's crazy. Tweaker. <laughs> Up for three days, like seeing what cars I could break in and take. I'm, I'm, the next morning, after those three crazy days, I wake up and I had a little ritual called wake and bake. Some of you guys might be familiar. I woke up and I started smoking some Mary J. And as I started smoking, I realized I'm not getting high. So I, I smoke another bowl and I smoke another bowl and I'm like, whoa, 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 I'm not, I'm, this is crazy. And God gives me a vision right there of me speaking on the Sierra Way campus stage, preaching with fire. I wasn't clapping when I got that. I was so scared and so full of shame in the broken state that I was in, and I didn't believe that God could still use me. Because I was, that, that night I, I, I was literally gonna murder someone. I had the gun out on them, everything, they're already done. One of my friends that just got the Marines was brave enough to come and grab me, take the gun away, some weird, whatever he did, kung fu. And I'm just thinking like, not me. I wanted to be in prison for life, for, like, for murder, like my brother. I wanted to make my dad proud. I, it's like, it didn't line up with the visions that I had for my life. At 15 years old, I wanted to be in prison, juvie, and then graduate into prison and run the prison systems with my brother. That was like my, my like dream. Too many blood in, blood out movies and boys in the hood. That was my, that, that messed me up there. But then I see this book on my, uh, on my counter table. I've never read it. A family friend gave it to me because they found out I was a Christian and they're like, man, we're so happy for you. They're a Christian. They gave it to me. To this day, I don't know where that book is, but I opened the book and in the book, the first two pages and it's all I've ever read of that book because I'm like I can't get high like oh man and like all right God's showing me a vision of me man man, let me just see what this book is and it was about a pastor in Las Vegas when he was a young adult how he was playing God he was come to church but he was really just hooking up with girls and like that was his his gimmick and then God just touched him and spoke to him and he just started crying and, and, and then what happened was crazy. He repented of his sins and he said, God, use me. And then he went on to become a successful pastor where he has multiple campuses. And as I'm reading this, new believer just reading this, then God said, see, I can use you still. It doesn't matter what your sins are. If, you, if you were, your sin was religion, if your sin was going back into the culture that, you, you, that God set you free from, man, I got some good news for you. Don't be afraid of the call. If God brought you into this room right now, God is so powerful that he could accomplish the call on your life if you will partner up with him. Stop looking at yourself so much. Stop looking at your brokenness so much and thinking that that has anything to do with where he wants to take you. Too long we've identified with our brokenness. And God says, when will you begin to identify with me? That brokenness was a season. I've already taken you out of it, but you're still mentally stuck in it. God wants to set our minds free. 
Do you know after you get delivered from something, you still got to renew your mind because that old way of thinking will take you back to the old way of doing? The second, my second point is God wants to use the brokenness in our families. He wants to use that broken family that you come from, if you come from one. If we're honest, we probably all have some brokenness in our families, right? He wants to use it. If there's a crack, think of a mirror or a glass. If there's a crack in that mirror, don't deny that there's a crack. What am I saying? If there's some stuff off in your family, even if you're serving God or whatever the case may be, don't fool yourself. Don't deny what's happening in the home. Take ownership of your home, of the relationships in your home, and even the extended family that God has blessed us with and say, God, I'm giving this family to you and I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm saying use me. Use me to serve my family. Not, God, get them all right. They're crazy. I'm cutting them off. You, you blew it with me this time. And I'm not answering your calls. God's saying, no, I want to use you. Because we can fool ourselves to thinking that it's just going to always be a crack. But if you've ever seen glass crack, it, well, the only thing that happens is that crack begins to grow until it actually shatters. It's going to eventually shatter. Address it with love. You're not going to win any family members over without love. Some of our families have never seen or experienced true love from a believer. You could win a lot of people over but just loving them. A lot of people. John 4, 46 through 54, it says, as he traveled through Gal Galilee, he came to Cana, where he had turned the water into wine. There was a government official nearby in Capernaum whose son was very sick. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged Jesus to come to Capernaum to heal his son who was about to die. Jesus asked, will you never believe in me unless you see miracles, signs, and wonders? The official pleaded, Lord, please come now before my little boy dies. Then Jesus told him, go back home, your son will live. And the man believed what Jesus said and started home. While the man was on his way, some of his servants met him with the news that his son was alive and well. He asked them when the, when the boy had begun to get better, and they replied, yesterday afternoon at 1 o'clock, his fever suddenly disappeared. Verse 53, then the father realized that that was the very time Jesus had told him, your son will live. And he and his entire household believed in Jesus. This was the second miraculous sign Jesus did in Galilee after coming from Judea. You see, his decision resulted in healing for his son, freedom for his son. His decision to bring his broken situation that the family was going through in their home. He decided to go uh, on, a, on a leap of faith and say, there's a man named Jesus. I, I, I'm, I'm going to go and find him. That's a seven-hour walk at least. If he was on a camel or something, it's like three to four hours. He went on a mission and said, look, I'm going to present this, this, this brokenness that's happening in our home. I'm bringing it to Jesus. And notice that he just went like, there were people at the home waiting for him, but he just took off. I'm gone. My family needs me. And I've heard of an answer. 
You see, we have the answer. And because we have the answer, we should be giving the answer out. We got our families are, are looking for the answer. They're getting it wrong on the test over and over and over. C, D, whatever it is. No, no the answer is A. I've had the answer all my life. Some of us are going to have to go to our family and say, look, I'm so sorry. I, I just want to apologize. I've had the answer this whole time. I've just been so scared and so focused on myself. I haven't given you the answer. I'm sorry. I've seen all the pain you guys have been going through all these years, and I've just been in, in my own little bubble, shut up, just closed. And I've known the answer this whole time. You're empowered to give that answer. God is always on time. Stop tripping about when it's going to happen. Take your situation to Jesus just like this guy did and get a word from Jesus. See, Jesus gave him a word. He said, your son will live. Jesus is still alive and well and speaking right now saying, your family will live. Your sons, your daughters, your aunts, your uncles, your parents, your grandparents, they will live. This is for all of you that are hearing it. Can you believe it? Can you be like a little kid, like a two-year-old, three-year-old kid that, that just will believe anything you tell them? Like, son, I, I invented thunder and all that. I made that. And they believe it? That faith like a child, that if God says it is, then it is. If God said it's done, then it's done. If God said I will, then he will. He don't make it complicated. He makes it real easy for us. His decision to bring his brokenness and his family, this is the most powerful part, to Jesus resulted in the whole house getting saved. That one person in that family, in that home, went to Jesus with the situation that they were going through and came back with salvation for the whole household. How many of you guys want to see your whole household get saved? How many of you guys want to see people around you get saved? Not just your, maybe your household is already saved, but you got some tios and some tias, some aunts and some uncles or whatever. You got cousins that need to be saved. God just needs someone willing to go. The third thing, God wants to use the brokenness in our community and our city. Nehemiah 1, 3 through 4, it says, they said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. When I read this, I noticed the brokenness of his city grabbed his attention. The brokenness, that was, I mean, if we're honest, how many of us complain about brokenness in San Bernardino or wherever your city is? We complain about uh, uh, a homeless problem. We complain about violence or we complain about different things, right? But see, Nehemiah, the way he handled it was just like so inspiring to me. Like I'm going, all of us, we're about to go after San Bernardino like never before. So y'all get ready. This is our time. He, it got his attention to the point where he said, I got to take this to God. You know what's, what's interesting about taking something to God? You know he's going to tell you to do something. Nehemiah knew because he had a relationship with God. He took it to God saying, God, what's up? What do, what, whatever happens, whatever you want to do, let's do it. I'm not bringing this to you 
to not be a part of the solution. I'm bringing this to you saying, God, use me. God, I'll step up right now. God, what is the solution? Let's make it happen. There's a, there's a, a, a certain posture, a certain mindset that we have to go into our prayer closet with in these end times. All the, the lukewarm stuff, all the mediocre stuff, I mean, all that is done. It's not going to work right now. It's not. All the comfort zones, it's not going to work. You know it's not going to work. If you're in a comfort zone place where it's all about you, you know, if you look me in the eyes, you know that it's not working. You know that God has called you to more and you don't understand what it is yet, but you know you haven't gone out to do it. If we had a real honest conversation and it's okay to be there I'm just saying let's get in the game let's get it started started now not one of you is unqualified the blood of Jesus has qualified every single person in this room if you would accept his his forgiveness and make him Lord in your life you're qualified that's it I don't care if you're a gang banging yesterday if you were snorting coke last night whatever you did this morning God said I will use you who are you to say you're disqualified when I don't even say you're disqualified? I don't care if you backslid and fell into adultery. Did you not see the story of the woman who was in adultery? What did I do with that? I handled all her haters and I said, let's go. Does the brokenness in your city, does it have your attention? Nehemiah 2.5 I replied, if it pleases the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. It's not enough to just pray. I'm not discrediting prayer, but I'm saying there's a formula. It's pray and then do. Right? Right? I believe that the world is tired of Christians that are just praying. I believe that the world is hungry to see Christians that pray and do with love and with power. I did a worship night at our house last night. Is it last night? Yeah, it was last night. And we, I mean, I brought my P12, Abriana's P12 together. And which is our discipleship groups for those that don't know, get in one. It's awesome. We, we, we mentor, 12, I mentor 12 guys, she mentors 12 women or so, and we brought them together and we said, let's just have a night of worship, letting God speak to us and pouring into us. But how about this? How about we invite the whole neighborhood and we tell them to come through? And it was just amazing to see how open, and, and, and we live in like a middle class, a higher, higher class, whatever you want to call it, neighborhood, where the stereotype is, is that those people, don't, they're closed off to the gospel. They're the hard ones to reach because they don't want to give you time. It's not true. I was just did it last night. It's a lie. No, I'm serious. I know in the, we could go to the hoods. I come from that stuff. Like, I, I, I agree we need to hit that. But I believe that if we're going to ever reach a city, which is our vision of the way world outreach. We're, we're going through inner cities throughout the world. We got to get the whole city, right? And sometimes people don't go in those neighborhoods because honestly, they might be a little timid. You got a lot of people that might just close the door in your face, whatever it is. But my team experienced not one negative response. I sent out about 24 people into the streets right before we started worship. Not one negative response. People were actually like, wow, I can't believe you're doing this. This is awesome. And we had five neighbors come out and worship with us and just really experience the presence of God. And I told them, this is where I live. Like, you guys could come through. Let me know. I'm going to get a sign out front of the house and say, if you need any prayer, hit me up. And it's going to have my number. Like, text your prayer in. But... You got to do something about your community. You got to do something about your city. You live in it. You live in it. You're, you're in that city for a reason. God wants to use you in the place that he has you. Some of us are thinking, should I move? 
Should I go here? Should I go there? Should I do this? I'll tell you this. Moving locations will never give you the satisfaction of fulfilling your purpose. I really believe that if God has you somewhere and he's planted you somewhere, be careful and be real wise on, on, on making a decision to uproot yourself and to take yourself somewhere else. Because at that point, my life is in my own hands. Someone's like, man, I like that other house though. You do what you want. I'm just, I just got to do my part, but you do what you want. <laughs> Nehemiah didn't just give attention to it. He gave time and he put his whole heart into making a difference. I think what keeps us back sometimes is we think someone else is actually going to do it. You think oh, some, someone else is going to make a difference. That's not my role. You think a guy like me that's like, oh, he, he's like a public speaker or use him. or blah. Do you know that, that your call is as valuable or more valuable than the call in my life to preach the good news? Whatever your giftings are, whatever it is that, you know, what's, what's interesting. I was reading a book and, the, and, and from, from John Bevere and as I was reading it, it was so interesting. He mentioned how your body your arms and stuff that is seen, you get complimented. Like, man, that looks like of who works out here. All right, who, who's going to start working out? All right, who just lied both times? Okay. But, but he mentioned that he, he, he knows someone that, that doesn't have an arm, but they have a, they're still living. They're still, they still have a family. They still have a job. They're still functioning. But he said, I, I don't know anyone that doesn't have a, a liver and they're just having a great life. And yeah, you know, when's the last time you had someone come up to you and say, hey, man, great, great liver. You're look, looking great. That liver's looking, mm, solid. I ain't never seen a liver like that before. I think, whoo. But what, may, what plays a vital role in a person's life? That arm that you could live without, or that liver that's behind that you don't see. Some of us, we, don't, we think that we don't have a significant gift or we can't do something in our community or in our families because we, we get too caught up in, well, uh, I either gotta be a pastor, a worship leader, or evangelist. If, if it's not that, then I'm nothing. God, what are you gonna use me for? And he has all these amazing, amazing gifts inside of you, amazing gifts. Some of us need to just pray and say, God, what are my gifts? Because some of us don't even know them. God, what are my gifts that you have given me? Some of us were techie and we got, like tech is like, you know it like the back of your hand and you, and you don't think that God will use that to preach the gospel? He will use that throughout the whole world if you will let him. Some of you guys love fashion and you're just great at designing things. God will use that. Whatever it is, God will use what you give him. Nehemiah 4, 15 through 18, it says, When our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to our work on the wall. But from then on, only half my men worked while the other half stood guard with spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. The leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah who were building the wall. The laborers carried on their work with one hand supporting their load and one hand holding a weapon. All the builders had a sword bouncing to their side. The trumpeter stayed with me to sound the alarm. It's going to take hard, hard, hard work to bring about change in your community. It's going to take countless hours, efforts, blood, sweat, and tears to bring about change. It's not going to come easy. You see how hard Nehemiah was working to, to bring about restoration to his people, to his city. You see, this is a part of the, you know, when you get saved and someone says, like, hey, like, when Jesus said, like, lay your life down, Right? deny yourself and follow me this is a part of the price of being a christian is jesus whatever it takes whatever it takes whatever you want me to do i'll do it how, how hard it is god i'll do it i'll make myself available
Check this out, Nehemiah 6.15, it says, So on October 2nd, the wall was finished, just 52 days after we had begun. When our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. You see, when a, when a broken city and a, and a broken community begins to transform, begins to be rebuilt, no one could deny that God was involved. No one can say that God don't exist. No, when a city like San Bernardino is flourishing, is prospering, is, is, is godly, no one can say that God doesn't exist. They had to acknowledge it. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. Do we serve a great, great God? The people that are not for you, the, the people that are not for God, for the church, it don't matter. They're still going to have to acknowledge him on earth and after. Because every knee will bow. But, but let's, let's get, I want them to acknowledge him here in our city. I want them to acknowledge him in our communities that they'll begin to understand, oh my gosh, like, We've been trying to do like something positive in the city and I know where these men, they're making a difference. They're transforming things and, and, and they're taking over territory. They're going to have to say it was Jesus. God used the brokenness of a city to reveal his love and to reveal his power. Let's all stand up. Give God a hand if you guys got something tonight. You know, this is the time to say yes to everything God has been speaking to you about. See, as I'm speaking, I don't know people's situations and things like that, but God knows the very detail of every situation. He knows every crack. He knows every broken piece. He knows every single thing. And God's desire is to do something about it for you. God wants to bring about change for you. God wants to say, let me handle it and take it from here. I'm going to do two calls today. The first call is going to be for those that you're, in a, you're, you're like, man, God, I'm, I'm broken. I'm in a broken place right now. I'm, I'm, I'm involved in ministry. I'm not involved. I'm a leader. I'm not a leader. Whatever you are, I've been saved 50 years. I've been saved one year. I, it doesn't matter. God loves you so much. It might be even your marriage. There's no marriage too broken for God to restore. but you gotta let him restore it. You gotta say, God, I'm done trying to be God. I'm done trying to restore it my way. I'm imperfect. I make bad decisions. I don't know what I'm doing. It, it's called humbling yourself before God. And once you humble yourself before God, you're gonna get his full power, support, love flowing in that situation because we could de deny his love we could deny his power we could deny the help and the, uh, he could be reaching out to you every second every moment and he is because he loves you so much but we could tr push it back push it back God saying stop pushing me away what is it gonna take for you to let me intervene what is it gonna take? If you're that person, if you're saying, I, I, I'm, I'm going through some broken times right now in my life, in my family, whatever it is, if there's some brokenness, I wanna pray for you. Let's just make your way up here to the front.
We're going to get healed tonight. We're going to get restored tonight. situations that were happening they seem so hopeless well, you're getting hope right now vision you're getting vision right now God's releasing fresh vision there it goes I want to do one more call one more and this is for anybody out there that doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and as their Savior. You haven't given your life to Jesus. God loves you. And John 3, 16 talks about how much he loves you and it, and it breaks down and says that he loves you so much that as you are on a path to hell, as you are on a path because of your sins that you've committed, as it was taking you down to destruction, to a place that no one could get you out of. That his love, his mercy was shown through sending his son Jesus 
to die on the cross for you which means that all the sin that you have committed all the the penalty of the sins that you have done they were going to be erased through the blood of Jesus Christ Jesus is in love with you he has always been in love with you he's not intimidated if you doubt him or if you don't believe or whatever your case is Jesus wants you Jesus is the answer Jesus is the way Jesus is the truth Jesus is the life there is no life without Jesus it's counterfeit it's fake Jesus is saying I'll give you everything that you actually want that that desire of life to quench that thirst that you have nothing can quench that thirst The reality is this, every one of us, one day we're going to breathe our last breath. You're breathing right now, but the truth is one day you will breathe your last breath and you will go into eternity forever and ever and ever. And you will live in eternity in one of two places, a place called heaven or a place called hell. God saying, I I already purchased your way to heaven. If you would just come to me, I will forgive you of your sins. I will transform you. I will make you whole. But most of all, You will live with me in eternity forever and ever and ever in a place where there is no pain, in a place where there is no shame, in a place where there is no destruction, in a place where the devil isn't running around. A place of total peace, a place in the presence of God forever. He prepared that place for you and I. And if you're saying tonight, God, this is, this, is, this is for me. God, I want to give my life to you. Jesus, I surrender right now my life to you. I did this over nine years ago, and I have zero, 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 zero regrets of saying yes to Jesus Christ. If you want to receive Jesus tonight as your Lord and as your Savior, I want to count to three, and I just want you to just lift up your hands. One, two, three. Lift up your hands. Wow. Amen. Keep them up. Keep them up. If you have your hand raised and you're not in the front yet, make your way to the front. Make your way to the front. saying I'm giving my life to Jesus today let's pray and as we're praying lift up your hands it helps us to identify you so we can have our leaders connect with you and help you on this walk with God but lift up your hands those that are receiving Christ and just say this with me we're gonna pray to God right now say Jesus I choose to come to you tonight you to please forgive me of all of my sins wash me clean set me free from all bondage of the enemy fill me now with your Holy Spirit I choose to put my faith in Jesus Christ I believe 
that you died on the cross for all of my sins and that on the third day you rose again and you have power over sin over death and from this moment forward I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ my life is yours God have your way in Jesus name I pray amen 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 I love every single one of you guys we're gonna pray and if there, there's people around you, let's pray together. I'm going to go and pray. If anybody is dealing with any demonic activity, I want you to come over here. I'm going to pray for you right here towards the center.